Hi and welcome to The Honest Channel. I'm Claire Johnston, a journalist with an interest in how to age well and look and feel good for longer. And today I'm bringing you an interview with the scientists behind a cosmetic breakthrough in which they've created synthetic copies of peptides that already exist in our skin but diminish with age. So essentially they're trying to put back what we lose over time. Peptides have the ability to send signals or messages to our cells and as Dr Mike Sherratt, Professor of Biochemistry at the University of Manchester and Dr Mike Bell, Head of Science Research at Number 7, are about to explain these peptides are designed to signal to our skin cells to repair themselves and reverse some of the damage caused by aging. They are the star ingredients in Number 7's Future Renew range, which launched in the UK in April and is now launching in the US and other markets. And I took a look at how it compared with some other innovative peptide-based skincare ranges recently in this video, which I'll also include in the description, along with details of the range we're discussing today. So let's hear now about how these peptides were discovered, how they work, and just what exactly they could do for our skin. Dr. Bell of Number 7 and Professor Sherratt of, of Manchester University, thanks so much to both of you for your time and congratulations too on what appears to have been a very successful launch for the Future Renew range in the UK. Thank you, Claire. We're delighted. Yeah, lots of interest. Um, it sounded like a long process of trial and error to discover the new peptides that you're using in the Future Renew range. I mean, what did that process involve in practice? And how did you know in the end that you'd found the golden geese? Go on, Mike. You, you, have, you start. Should I do? So we've been working, uh, myself and Mike have been working together for many years now. The relationship between Manchester and Boots goes back uh, many years, um, nearly sort of 15 years or more. And I think the key observations at the start, there were two of them. Um, we were interested in in how we can recognize damaged skin. So not the external part of skin, but how we can recognize damage to the proteins in skin. And we had a number of PhD students who were working on that question. And, and we, we hypothesized that some proteins were more susceptible to ultraviolet radiation than others. And we showed that experimentally. Mm -hmm. And then the other question we were interested in is, is which proteins are, uh, do you find in skin? It's what we call the proteome. So, what, what, which proteins are, uh, is the skin composed of? And again, we approach that by surveying the literature and and defining a skin proteome. So, now we knew we, we know which proteins are in skin, and we know which ones are damaged. And from the work of other people, we know that when proteins are damaged, they can liberate what are little fragments that are called peptides. Mm -hmm. And those peptides can be can be detected by cells and cause cells to behave in a different way. So Mike and I, over a coffee um, some years ago now, were, were wondering, well, if cells can detect these, these peptides, and we knew that some peptides were used in other successfully in other um, cosmetic preparations, mm -hmm. can we predict and make some new peptides that have the desired effects that that signal to the cells and cause the cells to, to start to repair skin. And, and I guess, Mike, it's fair to say that, you know, we know that these peptides exist in other tissues. Yeah. So where they act as alarm signals, basically. So the cells are there and they see this damage, these alarm signals, and they kind of go, goodness, there's damage happening. And I better make some more protein. I better make some more collagen or make some more of these fibrillin elastic springs and help repair. So it's a natural self-repair process. So what we were excited about was actually, could we tap into that and could we find a way to basically harness that natural self-repair process, boost it by putting back into the skin what's naturally produced as part of the damage pathway? And that's what we did. And so the, the most damage being caused by photoaging, basically, which is why, why you're referring to the, the UV um, light there. Um, how, how are the peptides sourced? I mean, are they were they plant based? I know you describe them as, as synthetic peptides. So what are they based on? So the, the peptides that what we've done is we've, we've basically worked out using machine learning and all of an artificial intelligence. We've worked out how the proteins would be damaged and which peptides would be liberated. So which were, how would the proteins be broken up 
And what would those little fragments be that Mike talked about? And we can identify exactly what they are, how long they are. And then the, basically the process is, well, not all of those can get into the skin because some of them are going to be too large, for example. Mm -hmm. Some of them actually would be unstable and you can't synthesize them. So through a process of screening through those potential peptides, of which there were thousands, we got to a number of peptides that we thought, actually, you could synthesize those and basically mimicking what happens naturally, which is what we did. Mm. So we worked with a partner who are experts in the development of the synthesis, I should say, of peptides. Mm. And basically, you add one amino acid to another and you create like little Lego bricks and you create your peptide. And, and that allows us then to test those peptides in the laboratory on cells to see how they respond. So this is not uh, taking or adapting plant-based peptides or animal peptides. This is recreating what happens naturally in human skin. Exactly, Claire. Yeah, exactly. Wow. That's right. So the, the peptides, the, the two peptides um, in this blend, one of them, um, there are four amino acids for each of the peptides, and, and one of them we find in, in lots of different collagens, because mm -hmm. there isn't just one collagen in skin, there are lots of different collagens, but we find it in, so it, it is found in human collagens, it's the same sequence that we find in, in human collagens, and the other one we find in some elastic fibre proteins, but also there's an interface between your epidermis and your dermis, um, and there's the specialised proteins there, and, and this other peptide we find in, in those specialized proteins. So two different major sort of sources, types of, of classes of proteins um, these peptides come from. Now, I've spoken to a couple of dermatologists along the way about peptides because I've, I've said a few times on the channel, I really do think this is the future. Clearly, it's the future of skincare. And this is another exciting development, I think, along that journey. But, you know, a couple of them have come back and said, well, they're too large to cross the skin barrier. So, I mean, how do they cross the, the skin barrier and how do we know that that's happened? It's a really, really good question, Claire. And mm -hmm. because actually in order to get through the skin barrier, they have to be pretty small. Yes. So this is one of the reasons we actually dismissed a lot of the peptides because they're just too large to get through. So you're absolutely right. A lot of peptides are too big and they would sit on the surface. But at the kind of the level of tetrapeptides, so four little Lego bricks, four amino acids, or pentapeptides, which is five, and below, those are small enough to be able to penetrate through the skin. Um, one of the difficulties, though, is actually tracking that penetration. Because if you are putting back into the skin what is nature identical, so there's already lots of these types of peptides around, it's quite difficult to try and find them when you try and track them. So it's like, like trying to look for a little piece of hay within a haystack, actually. <laughs> it's really hard. And so some of the work that we've been doing actually with the University of Nottingham as well, has been to try and use sophisticated techniques to do exactly that and track these small peptides through the skin. And we can track them through the stratum corneum, so through the skin barrier. Mm -hmm. um, and so we know that they're getting through and importantly, when you design your product, you might have a really lovely peptide that works brilliantly on your cells, but it's no good if you put it into a formulation that doesn't allow it to deliver properly yeah. into the skin. So we use um, some mathematical modeling to basically get the formulation exactly right so that the peptides prefer the skin to the formulation. So what happens when you put the formulation on the skin is that the peptides preferentially drive into the skin because they want to leave the formulations. So that's the other part of what we're doing here to make sure that, yes, the peptides do need to, to get to where they need to get to. And do you have any sense of how deep they go and at what, what, what point they stop? <laughs> so it, it, that's, a, I mean, it's a really, it's a, one of those questions. Mm. Um, the tools, techniques aren't really available yet to be able to map the distribution of these tiny peptides throughout the skin. So future advances will absolutely look at that. But what we do know is that single variably, when we put these peptides onto skin and we then look deeper down 
at what's happening to our fibrillin springs, for example, what we do know is that they're affecting them single variably. So in order to do that, they must be getting to the living cells to be able to um, pass on the right messages to help with that repair. So we know that, but we would love to know exactly, you know, all that distribution of peptide in the skin. But at the minute, the tools aren't there to be able to do that. I wanted to ask you about the clinical trial. Um, there was one involving 44 volunteers. And, um, you know, what, I was just interested in what were the benchmarks? You know, how, what, what did you use to assess the changes in the skin and, and what did they show? Yes, so um, this trial was a split face trial. So um, a split face trial where each volunteer has a control on one side and then they apply the, the, the serum in this case in on the other side. So they would apply an SPF 30 moisturizer, for example, and then your serum would go underneath on one side and then on the other side, they'd apply nothing as the mm. control. So each volunteer is their own control, basically. So you're comparing all the time the effects of the serum to the effects of, of, of that non-serum treated um, side. And what we have is we, we, it's really important for us to, um, to have measures that are consumer relevant, clinically mm -hmm. relevant. So we have um, expert grading scales that we use that are validated scales um, where experts assess the skin. So the volunteers come in, the um, assessors, the experts are blinded, so they don't know um, which side has been treated with um, the product. And, and then they grade them for various things like lines and wrinkles, and all the different types of wrinkles across the face. Um, they'll also grade the evenness of skin tone, um, pigmentation, um, the pores. So the distribution of pores and the size of pores, the firmness, for example, as well. And, and those measures then, what we look at is the, the change, the difference for the treated side versus the untreated side. And we look at that across all the volunteers. And what's really important for us, because in the UK, the regulations are very strict. There's a high hurdle rate. Mm -hmm. So we need to demonstrate that the majority of volunteers are getting consumer and clinically relevant net benefits. So that doesn't mean comparing back to baseline. So at time zero, it means comparing one side versus the other. Um, so it's based on human eye um you know what 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 someone what an expert is seeing but visibly it's not with 3d scans or anything like that no i mean we obviously take photographs as well and image mm -hmm. and we do image analysis mm -hmm. as well but ultimately for us what's most important is the the, the kind of relevance of the difference and mm -hmm. so these um photonumeric scales are published um they're actually what dermatologists will use um, and what you have to demonstrate is that the experts are, are truly experts. So repeatability. So, you know, if somebody comes in and then an hour later they come in again, that the grading is, is very repeatable. And, and that's important. That robustness is important when we put the data in front of the, um, the, the bodies that look at our claims and approve our claims for TV, for example, and, and other communication channels. So, I mean, people are going to be excited about this. Uh, we've already seen that, um, you know, it's been it's been launched with great fanfare. Um, but with someone from the more advanced signs of aging um, that have, have everything, you know, pigmentation and lines and so on. I mean, over a three month period, what benefits do you think they could expect to see? So, I mean, I think three months is 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 good because the biology, biology does take time to work. Yeah. So the peptides will take time to work, but within the products, there's other ingredients as well that provide moisturizing, smoothing, softening um, benefits that improve radiance within, within one to four weeks. Um, so we talk about multiple signs of damage with this new product range. Uh, and so multiple signs of that, visible signs of damage will be improved. We will be reversed. Um, within four weeks. Now, clinical levels of benefit take longer. And, mm -hmm. and what we see there is things like lines and wrinkles improving. Um, we see improvement in firmness. We see a more even skin tone. Um, we see actually skin that is more hydrated uh, as well and more radiant. So we talk about a number of different signs of damage that have been generated cumulatively over time due to lifestyle, due to exposure to the environment. 
Um, and after six months, we have 97% of those volunteers are showing um, improvements in multiple visible signs of damage. So, so those are the kinds of benefits we're talking about. And is that using um, just the serum? Is that people using a full range? So in terms of the clinical study, the clinical study is run on the serum. So the serum alone yeah. will provide those benefits. Okay. But obviously, when you add in the regime, you do get a boost to those benefits, of course. Um, and, we'll, you know, we'll always be saying it's really important. If you're going to apply another product with that serum, it's going to be the SPF 40 um, yeah. date cream because you can do all that um, improvement and um, in terms of signs of damage, but it's no good if you're if you're then not protecting your skin from the sun so, and yeah. preserving um, that repair that you've laid down. And um, you did the research, well, what looked to me, you did the research over the, the three month period. Um, how, I mean, do you expect those benefits to continue to unfold? I mean, presumably there's some kind of shut off point where it, it just doesn't keep going until you look, you know, 20 years old again. I mean, that's my hope. <laughs> um, what we see is we do see cumulative benefits so when we say cumulative we do mean that um the results do get bigger and better over time um but obviously as you're right i mean as you start to get towards i would say above six months um and actually we have a trial that's continuing beyond six months to 12 months um we we start to see benefits plateauing um because you know you're right you can't continue to reverse and get younger and looking and younger looking. It does hit a ceiling. Amen. And um, what we do know, though, in previous studies is if, the, if you stop using, then actually there is a bit of regression. Right. And, you know, so continual use um, is, of course, really important. And, and as, as I say, we do see cumulative benefits over what is a, a long, a long term clinical trial. Um, and I was just also interested in the biopsy um, that you did as well. So you took you, eight volunteers wore a patch um, with the, the peptides under the patch. Um, after 12 days, it showed that their skin had increased levels of fibrillin proteins. So it, it'd be good to hear a bit more about how significant a finding you thought that was um, and whether there were any visible changes on the skin afterwards as well. So, I mean, I think if I start, Mike, and maybe then, and I'll stop waffling on, and yeah, actually you can. Um, Fibrillin is really important for us because um, it's an early marker of aging, but also repair. So fibrillin gets broken down very early on in the aging process. I mean, we can even see from some of the work we've done um, with the team at Manchester, that even in your twenties, um, your fibrillin especially in photo, photo exposed sites is damaged, even though there are no visible signs of damage necessarily on the surface. Um, so fibrillin is really important. And we do know that um, transretinoic acid, which is the gold standard mm. prescription um, drug for treatment of um, photo damaged skin, we know that that uh, improves lines and wrinkles, improves photo age um, appearance over the long term, and one of the ways in which it seems to do that is by improving these fibrillin springs um, in the skin. So there are a number of reasons why, for that reason, we, we use it as an indicator that what we found on cells in dishes, if we can show that actually you're starting to improve these springs, then you know that it's, this, these benefits on cells is translating to inhuman and on real skin. So we use it as an early marker and an indicator that, yes, these peptides, this technology is working. So for us, it was actually a really, really pivotal moment in the in the project because we did all this previous work and then it's kind of... It's just yeah. over. And, and, you know, we had COVID at the same time and it no. was just... And where we could <laughs> actually go into the labs and test on, on, um, on skin. So it was a really pivotal moment for us to say, actually, we do have something that's really special. I don't know if you want to add anything, Mike. Uh, thanks, Mike. Yes, I, just, just to add that in addition to, to staining for this fibrillin and, and seeing mm. these candelabras, mm -hmm. these, uh, the, these, these structures of fibrillin, we also did um, a, a technique called transcriptomics. And what that allows us to do is to see what the peptides, how the peptides are, are changing 
which proteins cells will be making. It's called the transcription. And, and what we saw is not only those elastic fiber proteins, the fibrillin, but we also saw lots of proteins that are involved in collagen fibrils as well. And collagen is another major aspect of, of the dermis. So the structure of collagen and then other, other proteins being switched on or genes being switched on, which control things in the epidermis. So um, the, sort of the, the maturation, the, the making a, a mature and, and functional epidermis mm -hmm. as well. So these peptides were having effects on, on multiple aspects of skin biology. Well, Dr. Bell mentioned um, retinoids there, uh, retinoic acid. Um, I mean, does this kind of technology negate the need to use a retinoid, do you think? I mean, some people that it creates sensitivity or would you recommend that people use this in conjunction with a retinoid? I mean, that's, it's a really good question. And I, I don't think it necessarily negates the need for, for retinoids. And retinoids have other benefits as well, of course, mm -hmm. in the acne space. Mm -hmm. um, what we see with um, retinol and mm -hmm. retinoic acid is epidermal effects as well. So it quite rapidly can produce um, skin renewal, for example. So skin can look smoother and more radiant. So it can work quite quickly on epidermal cells. <clears throat> and, and so actually, there is a case for putting the two together, I would mm -hmm. say, mm -hmm. you know, where you're trying to deliver some more immediate benefits, um, which retinol can do. And obviously you want to invest in retinol for long term as well um, for some of those photo aging uh, improvements. But I think the peptides can work almost com in a complementary way to that, um, improving for the longer term. What I would say, of course, is that there is overlap between some of the benefits delivered and not everybody can tolerate retinol or retinoic acid and won't mm. get to use retinoic acid. So with high strength retinol, for example, um, not everybody you know, can tolerate it and, and some skin is sensitive to it. So in that case, from a peptide point of view, and peptides are very, very well known, uh, especially when they're mimicking what's happening naturally in the skin, to be well tolerated and, and to work for, for everybody because it's just what's naturally happening in, happening in the in, inside, you know, in your skin and in your body. Yeah. So I think, you know, to answer the question, I think they can be complementary. But mm -hmm. for those people who are, really don't like retinol, their skin doesn't like it, then, then peptides can be a really good alternative. We're, we're still at the early stages, really, with peptides, aren't we? And, and discovering their full, full potential. And, and you mentioned the kind of unknowns around, you know, how, how far they go. I mean, are there any concerns around um, safety when we're altering cell signaling in our skin? I mean, I suppose that the, 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 the genes that are being switched on are all the genes that you would expect and, uh, to be involved in sort of normal skin function. Um, mm -hmm. From a, a toxicology point of view, we haven't seen any adverse effects. Mm -hmm. Multiple measures have been used. Um, uh, Mike, you probably can go into those measures more than I, but uh, those sort of toxicology studies, standard toxicology studies, haven't raised any concerns. Um, and and where these peptides are, are mimicking what we normally see in skin. Um, that's that's perhaps how I would best answer that. No, I think that's right, Mike. I mean, I think by actually putting something that's naturally happening in the skin back in the skin actually you know it from a from a putting something natural back it's it's much better from a mm -hmm. from a potential to to, to develop uh, side effects um we've tested now on more than 4000 consumers uh, in terms of the technology and you know what we're seeing is re really really well tolerated products and technology across the board across skin types across different ages mm -hmm. as well and in many ways, it's, it's quite similar to a lot of other peptides that have been developed for the cosmetic market. Um, the difference here is the amino acid sequence, and it is actually replicating what's happening yeah. naturally in the skin. So, um, no, we've gotten, I mean, we wouldn't have brought it into the market if we had any concerns whatsoever yeah. about um, tolerance issues um, because, it, I mean, you know, it's important for, the, for number seven, and we're a, it's a mass market brand. Um, we're bringing a, a new chemical entity, kind of a, a new bespoke peptide to the market. So it's, of course, critical that we've done all the toxicology work, um, all the work to show that it's really, really safe across all diverse skin types as well. Um, and, you know, and delivers the benefits, right? Yeah. That's, that's really important. Absolutely. Too. Oh, that's good to hear. Um, 
my final question, because we're running out of time, is it's probably the biggest one. <laughs> um, I mean, what do you think um, that the future holds in terms of peptide technology? I mean, how far could this go when we're looking at anti-aging? Wow, what a question. Well, mm. I mean, I think in many ways we're scratching the surface. There's an awful lot we still don't un understand about, about peptides and their potential. Um, but what we're seeing across other medical fields is that they're big business. Mm -hmm. And this mimicking natural, pep, natural hormones, for example, oxytocin, and um, even insulin. Insulin is a peptide. It's a larger peptide, but it's a peptide. Um, and look how they've revolutionized medical fields. So I think for us, you know, this approach of there are lots of peptides that work in the skin. Peptides are fundamental to skin biology, whether it's at the surface in those surface layers or deeper down. And can we tap into that to develop peptides that have multiple effects or very specific effects? So I just think it all comes back to you have to have a really deep understanding of what's going on in the skin and the role that peptides play naturally. And that allows you to tap into this natural process that's going on and isn't that better for everybody if we're putting stuff back into the skin that's kind of naturally happening you're just mm -hmm. giving it a helping hand rather yep. than trying to create something very different and alien you know yeah yeah professor sherrod do you share that view absolutely uh, it, it's a fundamental i think it's a fundamental biology question really interesting how do cells know that their environment's been damaged and how can we then prompt them to repair it and if you're asking that question, that's applicable to skin, but it's applicable to, to lots of age-related diseases. Um, if we think about lots of tissues, about loss of cartilage, osteoarthritis, lots of mm. different um, organs undergo aging. We don't have any experimental data yet, but I think it's immensely exciting to think that perhaps this is a way that you could start to predict peptides that, that would act on cells in, in lots of other organs and tissues. Yeah. Well, these are exciting times. I really appreciate your time today, both of you. Thank you, Claire. Nice to see you. Nice to meet you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks so much. Cheers, guys. Bye. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that interview. Do let me know what you think in the comments section. And remember that if you did enjoy the conversation, then by liking this video and podcast, you help it reach more people. You'll find lots more interviews like this one on the channel. So if you haven't already, I hope you'll consider subscribing. Until next time, Thanks for watching and listening.